I'd like to give you a real world example about how this looks. And this is specifically from some research that I did with a colleague of mine at the University of Toronto. We were interested in geospatial data and the citation of geospatial data sets within the research literature. And the first thing that we needed to do was think about geospatial data and how we wanted to try to find all the studies that specifically use geospatial data sets. So the first thing that we had to do was think about our different concepts. The first one was a geographic information system. So that's fairly straightforward. Those were the two terms that we came up with. But then we were interested in the use of geospatial data in geographic information systems. That was one of our limiting uh, factors. But then what we needed to do was think about the concept of geospatial data and how you would, uh, the different iterations for those for that term. So first of all, you have the concept of spatiality, which really come out to three main, three main terms, spatial, geospatial, or geospatial with a space in between the two words. And then the concept of data. And that's a tricky one because you've got data, but all, when you're talking about data sets, you've got data layers, databases, all kinds of different iterations there. DMTI is a kind of a data set, geocoding, a type of analysis used. And what we wanted to do was link all those terms together. So spatial data, spatial data layer, spatial database, or geospatial data, or geospatial data layer, or geospatial database. So you can see how you can link all these concepts together to get multiple iterations. I'll show you how to do that in a, in a further video, but I just wanted to say this is how this kind of concept can work out in real life. And it actually came out to look something like this. Now this was a little bit, that, that was one of the searches that we entered in one database. So with respect to creating a search strategy, the purpose of creating a search strategy is first of all, to systematically search specific topics using specific databases. And then as you're doing that, to thoroughly document your research, and the overall goal is to prevent as much as possible needless repetition. Now, maybe you've had instances where you're excited about your initial research project. You start by searching in a particular database, you download a bunch of citations, you come back and then you don't realize what you've done and you have to go through and run your search all over again. Or perhaps uh, even worse, you might be working in a database like ProQuest, which has a timeout feature. <laughs> And if you haven't logged in, you maybe go away to get a cup of coffee and come back and realize that your search is timed out and you've lost all your results. So it's a good idea to sit down, create a search strategy, document it, and then at least you've got it for when you go back. Uh, if one of these things should happen, or maybe if you do want to take a break and you want to come back later, you can say, okay, I know that I've gone into Web of Science and I've run the following searches. Now I need uh, to go back to Web of Science and run, uh, you know, searches. I've done one, two, and three, and now I need to run searches four, five, and six. So when it comes to the steps that you take, first of all, you can take your research thesaurus and use that to create search strings. We've already kind of touched on how you might do that already. Then you might determine what databases or individual journals you want to run your search in. And you can experiment. You don't have to just do one thing in one database or limit yourself. And I encourage you not to do that. But sometimes I think people, maybe they get uh, confused or think that they're going to break the database. You, you won't feel free to experiment and try out different things. You may even want to run a few series of experimental search strings before you get into your main search. That's probably not a bad idea. And then save your results because some of the things that I've mentioned already, you may find that you, if you don't save your results, you'll lose them. And you don't have to save a long list of PDF documents either. You can save the searches that you run or the results that you get in individual databases. And I'll show you as well how you can do that. 
And I find this is something a lot of students do, you know, novice researchers tend to just download PDFs at will. And one of the problems with that is when you download a PDF, often you're just getting a, you're just getting a numbered file, which is gibberish. And when you go back into your folder and you look at your PDFs with that are numbered files, you have no way of knowing what that PDF is actually about. And it, involves a lot of manual if you want to you know name that file something meaningful for you that involves a lot of manual work there's a better way to do it i think you'll agree when i show you later on so um, moving on i wanted to show you another real world example this is a search that comes from an article that was published in ecosystem services the journal Ecos ecosystem services it was a systematic review of urban ecosystem services again a number of years ago but when you're doing a systematic review you actually have to document the sources that you use you have to document your search strategy and one of the reasons for that is so that your readers know exactly what you've done and they might even go back and replicate your results if they're doing something similar that is one of the goals of a true system uh, a true systematic review is to allow for replication of the review later on down the road so their search that they come that they came up with i've just copied their search string so there's that term that i introduced before that they came up with and ran in two different databases. First of all, they ran it in what was then called Web of Knowledge, that's now Web of Science. And you can see that they did TS as a topic search, and they've created this long search string linking together their terms using Boolean operators, truncation, and various things like double quotes and parentheses. And I'll explain what's happening here later. They also took that search and basically replicated it into Scopus. And the, the terms are a little bit different. A topic search in Web of Science is essentially the same as doing a title, abstract, and keyword search in Scopus. And then they're documenting how many hits they uh, retrieved in each database. So you can see that it's getting relatively complex. But the good thing is you could take a search like this and copy and paste it across multiple databases and it will retrieve the same kind of results it will work in each database so that's very that's very handy to do when you're getting into complex searching now with respect to documenting your research this is fairly straightforward you could use and create your own research notebook that could be a word document um, I personally have used a spreadsheet when I had a, a research project a few years ago with a colleague at the library. We created a Google spreadsheet and we documented what databases we used, what were the search strings that we ran, and the results that we found. Some people find that that's helpful. And you could note down the date that you did your search, the exact search that you performed, and the database that you used. And then you could save your search or your results in the actual database, like ProQuest, like Web of Science, like Geobase or Scopus. They all allow you to do that. Or you could save your citations into a reference manager like Zotero. I'll talk about that in a future video. So thank you for watching. This is the end of part two, and please proceed on to part three.